Northern builders once transformed fragile, fast-rotting wood into material that could outlast generations, and they did it without hardeners, resins, or chemicals. Now, if you think about it, the old wooden structures you see standing today really do showcase an incredible longevity. This was not myth or exaggeration. Archaeologists continue to uncover softwood beams, posts and planks in Scandinavia, the Baltic and northern Britain that have survived centuries of exposure. Pine and spruce, woods modern builders dismiss as disposable, were made dense, resilient and rot-resistant through a process that worked with biology, climate and time. The trick was not a coating. It was a sequence of conditioning steps that fundamentally altered how wood behaved. You know, northern craftsmen understood that softness in wood is not weakness, but actually untapped structure. Softwood is, well, porous by nature. Those pores, they move water, sap, and air. Northern builders realized that if those pathways were emptied, collapsed, and then stabilized in just the right order, the wood would harden from within. Instead of, you know, just trying to seal the surface, they actually changed the internal structure. This is why, you see, softwood beams in medieval halls sometimes ring when struck, behaving more like stone than timber. The process began with cutting trees at the biological low point. Trees were felled in deep winter when sap flow was minimal. This reduced sugars, starches and moisture before the process even began. Cutting at the wrong season left too much internal food for decay organisms and too much water to manage later. Modern application starts here. When possible, harvest or source timber cut during dormant seasons. This single choice determines how effective every later step will be. Water immersion was used to hollow the wood from the inside without weakening it. Fresh logs were submerged in cold rivers, bogs, fjords, or lakes for extended periods. Flowing water was ideal, but cold, oxygen-poor bog water worked exceptionally well. This soaking leached out remaining sap, sugars, and soluble compounds while leaving the cellulose structure intact. Over weeks or months, the wood lost what rot feeds on. At the same time, mineral ions from the water slowly migrated into the wood, subtly increasing density. A practical modern method involves fully submerging logs or rough-cut beams for several weeks. The water, you know, must remain cool. It's important to weight the wood down to prevent floating. And, well, you really want to avoid warm, stagnant conditions that encourage bacterial damage rather than leaching. Freeze-thaw cycles were deliberately exploited, not avoided. Northern climates provided a powerful tool. Winter. After soaking, wood was exposed to repeated freezing and thawing. Water trapped in the wood expanded and contracted, collapsing internal capillaries and tightening the grain. This natural compression reduced the wood's ability to absorb water later. Once dried, it became far more dimensionally stable and uh, harder to resaturate. To apply this today, allow soaked wood to remain outdoors through cold seasons before final drying. Artificial freezing can work, but, you know, natural cycles produce superior results. Slow seasoning completed the transformation from soft to stone-like. After immersion and winter exposure, wood was stacked off the ground under cover, but, you know, fully ventilated. This drying phase was never rushed. Months or even years were allowed for moisture to leave gradually. As water exited the compressed cellular structure, the wood stiffened permanently. The result was timber that resisted denting, absorbed less moisture, and supported greater loads 
than untreated equivalents. Modern builders often skip this step entirely. Reintroducing it is honestly the difference between wood that lasts decades and wood that lasts centuries. Light surface charring sealed the transformation without sealing the wood. In some cases, northern builders lightly scorched the exterior. This burned off remaining surface sugars and hardened the outer fibers while keeping the interior breathable. The wood shed water easily but dried quickly when wet. Unlike modern hardening treatments, this did not create a brittle shell. It reinforced what the conditioning process had already achieved. So, a simple application involves evenly passing the flame over the surface, stopping before any deep cracking occurs, and then, you know, brushing away the loose char. The wood darkens, hardens, and becomes, well, remarkably resistant to decay. Why this trick made softwood outperform untreated hardwood? Hardwoods resist rot through density and tannins. Conditioned softwood achieved resistance through structure and starvation. Once sugars were removed and capillaries collapsed, fungi just couldn't establish themselves even in damp conditions. This is why pine posts preserved this way still stand where oak has failed. Why the method was forgotten despite its success. The process requires time, space and patience. Industrial building replaced these with speed, coatings, and chemical treatments. The result was convenience, not durability. Northern builders, you know, they accepted long preparation because they built for descendants, not just schedules. This forgotten trick, well, it still works, because wood biology, honestly, has not changed. Water still carries nutrients. Freeze still compresses structure. Air still dries timber. These forces, they remain reliable because they are, after all, natural. If you work with wood, restore historic structures or value techniques tested by centuries of survival, this knowledge really deserves revival. Subscribe to Thermal Vault, share this guide with fellow builders and history enthusiasts, and help preserve the northern wisdom that once turned ordinary wood into something that endured like stone.